What's up, investors? It's Mike from MJF Invest. Uh, tonight's video is going to be about Palantir Technologies, ticker symbol PLTR. Uh, I have two videos that I've already done about Palantir, and if you haven't checked those out, I'll drop a link in the description so you can follow along. Uh, but you don't have to watch them in any particular order. I'm going to do the best I can to catch you up and really uh, break down you know, what's been going on with Palantir, and I really wanted to get into what they do. Uh, the more I talk to people, a lot of people like this company, and it's a popular company, people are talking about it, but I don't think everybody knows exactly how the business model works, or exactly what it is that Palantir does, so I wanted to make a video to, you know, show you how I'm interpreting their business model, and what their products are, uh, but before I go any further, please hit that like button, Consider subscribing to the channel for future content. Let's talk stocks in the comment section. I'm not a financial advisor, so you should be doing all your own research. Ultimately, it is your decision whether you want to buy or sell. You know, any of the stocks I talk about on my channel. The reason I really was attracted to Palantir and wanted to do another video about Palantir was because I really started to see this as a story stock. Uh, I'm a sucker for story stocks. You know, once I started seeing the story, I really saw the potential. So... Palantir is kind of fitting in that mold. Uh, to, to understand Palantir, you'd have to know that the founder, Peter Thale, was also a co-founder of PayPal. And at the time, for automating fraud detection, uh, was solely based on algorithms. And so PayPal took the approach of increasing the effectiveness of each human analyst with the computer. So they, they kind of used like a hybrid of human and technology. Um, and, it, and it proved to be the best, most effective way to solve the problem. Uh, they went on, you know, and now look, PayPal is one of the be better companies in the world. Yahoo bought it in 1999 or 1998. Um, and, you know, the rest is history. Post 9-11, Peter Thiel thought that PayPal's fraud detection software system uh, that was developed at PayPal could be configured to help the government uh, with counterterrorism. So they, they worked closely with the government hand in hand. You know, they watched how they collected data and watched how the government used data until 2008, Palantir came out with Gotham. So Gotham was founded in 2008 after closely working with the government to understand how the government used data. And the best way I could describe Gotham is it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But the actual quote I heard from company Alex Karp was, it's like finding a needle in 10,000 haystacks. Gotham takes raw data, structure or non-structured, accesses various existing databases seamlessly, enabling users to identify patterns deep within data sets. Gotham is ideally used for counter-terrorism and money laundering activities. They also are planning to get into pl mission planning as well as defense operations. So Gotham is designed to help you find what you're looking for within, a, 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 within the data. Foundry is the second platform. Foundry is the software platform for the commercial sector. It integrates new databases routinely, so users can integrate and analyze data all in one place. Uh, Foundry will not only be the central operating system for individual customers, they plan to take over entire industries. I'm going to get into the forward deployed engineers, the FDEs that Palantir uses in a second, or as that engineer works hand in hand with each customer, it opens doors and for the rest of the industry or the sector. So if that's really interesting and that's really cool. So you, you know, look for Palantir as they break into one industry that other companies will follow along because now Palantir would be structured and ready for them. And, you know, customizable in a customized way, uh, which is really interesting and fascinating. And what I really love about Palantir is that their setup, their plan is for the long haul. They're not, um, they're not in a sprint. They're in a marathon. The first year they acquire a new customer, it, it's not profitable. But as the years go on and they, uh, they adapt and they become more essential, because we got to remember that Palantir is not a replacement for the data infrastructure within a company. It sits on top and combines the data of the company and the operations of the company. So, you know, it's one of those things that 
once companies have it and it and it and it's moving along and they, like they need it at that point, it becomes essential. The more they use it, the more they need it. So their customer retention is very high, very good. They have 125 customers globally spread across 36 different sectors. Uh, there's a $119 billion addressable market. Uh, 56 of Palantir's customers are on the commercial end and 63 of them are government contracts. Palantir's scalability is based on their existing customers. They, they, they sell more, they spend more as they build longer and longer lasting relationships with Palantir. Palantir's average revenue per customer in 2019 was $5.6 million and their top 20 customers was the average revenue was $24.8 million. Now, what I found interesting is the average customer relationship with Palantir of their top 20 customers is 6.6 .6 years. So that shows right there that they build relationships. They work with their customers. So, you know, that, that that's a sign of a good product. Um, and the more that I'm looking into their business model, it is, uh, it is a little bit tricky but you also have to uh, remember that they're heavily in, they make heavy R&D research and development investments. Uh, I was talking about the FDEs, which is the forward deployed engineers. Uh, th that's a pretty big expense. Uh, you know, with employment, it's somebody out in the field working with all these various customers to customize Palantir's product to the customer's needs. Uh, that stuff costs money. When, Alex Harp was asked about Palantir's path to profitability. This is what he had to say. Products years before people build them, and that takes money. And what you see in the COVID uh, pandemic crisis is we had built this way of going to market with Foundry, which would allow us to literally supply an enterprise with a completely new stack of products within six hours and maintain them. Um, and what you saw when we did that is we grew the company 49%. 49% off of a 743 base. And the divergence between expenses and, uh, and growth is dramatic. Um, and we're, we're just gonna be very, very focused on, on invigorating our software offering. Um, but when you're growing 49% off of a 740 base, um, I think that's a pretty strong indication of what the future could hold. And see, he was not too concerned. He's, he's more about the innovation. He understands, I think, to stay ahead and stay relevant, they need to spend a big chunk of money on research and development, and they will make up for it down the line with these long lasting relationships, uh, as these companies will need Palantir's. So Officer Carp is also very confident about his company. Uh, I found this to be a very interesting comment. We are going to be the most important software company in the world, and people will figure out what that's valued over a long period of time. And we're very comfortable with investors toying around. It could be like this. It could be like that. We are going to deliver the world's best software with the world's most efficient way of delivering it. And I think you'll find in, in a number of years that there will be a consensus. Palantir is a truly special software company that is arguably the most important software company in the world. And that's what I like. I like to hear a CEO talking just like that. Very confident, very bullish on his own company. Uh, I looked on Glassdoor. That's a... Um, that's a, a a platform where you can see what cust um, what employees think of the CEO. Alex Harp had an eighty six percent approval rating amongst his uh, employees, so he's respected and liked within his company. That's a pretty good approval rating, eighty six percent. That's also to be noted. Uh, also interesting too, their new products. I know that they're working on um, a new platform called Apollo. Apollo will allow Palantir software to be run in drones, submarines. Uh, off offshore uh, oil rigs and, and, and vice versa, basically anywhere. So they're becoming more innovative and they're getting better. And as the years go on and on, I would expect this company really to be a powerhouse. You know, I think this is a long-term hold. I said I would get back to you and let you know if I invested. In the first video, I had talked about a little bit about uh, swing, swing trading options. Uh, that worked out really well because at the time, Palantir was trading at $9. It's almost $16 now. So those those swing trades, those contracts, I was I was swinging. They, they worked out pretty good. Um, I actually am now invested in Palantir. Uh, once I invest in a company uh, like Palantir, I just let it sit. It's just gonna. I'm not gonna be so involved in the day to day price. I now view Palantir as a long term investment, and I'm now a Palantir bull. Um, and I'm planning on bringing more videos and more content. 
if you like Palantir, you definitely want to want to join the family. Uh, we got a, a really cool, positive uh, community. Uh, thank you for all the earlier support, guys. We're getting close to 200 subscribers, so please hit that subscribe button. Let's see if we can get like 50 likes on this video. That would be that would mean a lot to me. So please hit that like button. Uh, and again, uh, stay tuned. More Palantir videos coming. I hope you found some value in this video. Thank you for watching.